Welcome to the education technology session. I'm Caitlin Tagarelli. As I said, I work at Mango Languages. So I think that's how I became here as moderator of this panel. Um, and we have, it's Rachel as our support person. Sorry, hi, there she is. Uh, thank you. So we are going to talk to some panelists who have had different routes in from linguistics to education technology. We have uh, Sam Cooper from No Red Inc., Emily Moline from Duolingo, and Anastasia Lukina from ETS. I'm going to let them each introduce their self, themselves and tell you a bit more about themselves. Um, I have some questions prepared to get the conversation going, and then toward the end, we'll make sure that you all have a chance to ask your questions as well. So uh, I'd like to start by giving each of you a chance to introduce yourselves. Would anyone like to go first? You can tell us a little bit about you know, who you are, what you're doing, and, and how you got there in a couple minutes. I can go first. OK, perfect. My name is Anastasia Lukina. I'm currently managing senior research scientist in NLP and speech group, which is now called AI Labs at Educational Testing Service. I started my linguistics journey as a modern Greek scholar, and I started it as a specialist in modern Greek and actually Byzantine studies. And I did my PhD in Oxford in phonetics, and my PhD was on phonetic variation in modern Greek. So I went to Greek villages, I recorded elderly speakers. I looked into how their speech compares to each other. After that, I stayed in Oxford and I did a postdoc, which was also in phonetics, but moving more into more technical aspects and into machine learning. And after that, I came to ETS as an associate research scientist, and I've been here for eight years, since 2013. And what I have been doing here, we are building NLP-powered backends for various educational applications. That could be automated scoring engine for speech, it could be backends for reading tutors, it could be backend for learning applications. And at this point in my career, I'm primarily managing other people who are doing research or engineering into how to build the backend that then provides feedback on your speech. Great, that's so interesting. I'm, I'm excited to hear more about how you made that link from phonetics to, uh, to NLP. Um, Sam, would you like to go next? Sure. OK, so my name is Sam Cooper. Um, you might be able to tell that I'm originally from the UK, but currently based out of San Francisco. Um, where I work for No Red Inc, which is an education tech company that creates writing and grammar curriculum for grades 5 to 12. Um, I did a BA in German and Linguistics at the University of Oxford, and during that time had a student job teaching English in the summers in Germany, which set me, up, set me on the path of becoming an ESL teacher after university. Um, I spent five years in Spain. Um, teaching English as a foreign language to really all levels from absolute beginners to extremely fluent people, all ages from seven to I think about 70-ish. Um, so very diverse teaching experience. And when I moved to California, for personal reasons, I had to find something new to do and ed tech was it. Great, thank you. Um... Okay, I see, I just see in the chat that some people are a little bit confused about what the back end is. Uh, as, before we get on to Emily Anastasia, do you want to explain that? I explained in the chat, sorry for using okay. the specialist term. So back end is actually the piece of software in the back that would take your response at the essay or your recorded response, do various processing and then give back score or feedback. So this is what we call back end. <laughs> that Thank software you. that processes what you give it. Thanks. Um, okay, and Emily. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Emily Moline. Uh, my background to Duolingo is, you know, similarly, I started out in a tra more traditional research perspective, kind of like Anastasia. I got my PhD in linguistics from UC Davis in 2018. My focus was on applied linguistics and sociolinguistics, and my dissertation was on uh, kind of an applied um, research perspective looking at adult literacy, um, English teaching. So I'd always been interested in the applied aspects of language teaching, but from this more theoretical perspective, I also 
similar to Sam, had a lot of experience teaching English, both at the uh, college level, as well as also to English learners in Spain, as it turns out. Um, so for me, I was sort of just interested in exploring other options outside of academia. I was into the idea, and still am, that educational technology can have a really outsized impact um, for folks like us who have linguistic backgrounds and ideas about teaching and scaling language. So my first job um, was a kind of funny one at a, a marketing company doing professional naming of products. That was me playing out with what it would be like to use my linguistics degree in other places. Um, that didn't feel, feel like a great fit to me. So when the Duolingo opportunity came along, that felt um, something more relevant um, to my background in applied linguistics and theories of teaching. So at Duolingo, I am a curriculum designer and I think about how to apply the best practices of language teaching and pedagogy to an app. So the skills that I uh, honed in the classroom and through my research, looking at the role of oracy in literacy learning, I now think about teaching to millions of people, <laughs> which is very different and um, full of lots of interesting challenges. And at Duolingo, I have done specific work on certain courses like the English course for speakers of Spanish and the English course for speakers of Russian, which are separate courses entirely, as you can imagine. Um, but I've also consulted on various aspects like our teaching um, of speaking through live events and other uh, languages that are teaching um, non-English languages to folks with a background in English. So a, a variety of things. Great, thank you so much. I'm really excited to hear more from all of you. Uh, so I, you talked a bit about your career paths and the first thing I wanted to ask you is, how did you get your first job after graduating with your linguistics degree? What did you do to get that job? I, I mean, for me, I just, this is, I think people hear, you hear this a lot, but you, I was casting a broad net. I was applying to a lot of different things. Um, as I mentioned, this first job that I had wasn't one that really felt like a good fit for me. I was there for like kind of a fellowship for a year. Um, so that's another tip is, you know, your first job that you get doesn't have to be your forever job also. Um, but uh, I would just applied blind to the website. I didn't know anybody. That being said, um, I also did a ton of informational interviews. And that's another thing that people probably told you to do. And I highly do encourage you to take them up on that. Um, it was just a great way for me to get a sense of what was out there and what kinds of skills were needed. I started doing those when I was still in grad school. And I also really found them super valuable to understand the landscape of, of jobs. And it helped me to, to prepare for the Duolingo job. I knew that at that point, that was something that was more appealing to me because I had done four or five informational interviews by that point. Great, so that was just like an application that you saw online that you applied to? Great. Um, and did you have informational interviews with people that were at, at that company or? in sort of other areas? Um, so I didn't for that job, but it would have been a good idea for me to do that. And that is something that is available for you to do to reach out to folks who are at that company before actually submitting an application. Um, that's helpful both for you to get a sense of what they do, as well as to tailor your application and your cover letter better to um, more accurately capture what the rule is actually going to be. OK. Um... Sam, would you like to tell us next about how you got your first job? Yeah, well, my first job out of university was a teaching job. But there was another bit of a gap between me graduating from university and me getting that job because I had intended to go to grad school and graduated in a recession and the funding was not there. So I had to take a minute to figure out next steps um, and ended up qualifying as an EFL teacher. That's a separate course that you need to do in order to be able to teach in some of the more reputable schools. Um, I had a lot of clarity um, going into that, knowing that I wanted to teach, and I don't know that I really considered that many other options until several years later. So for me, the question was just like, okay, what country am I going to live in? Because um, I figured, hey, I have a German degree, I'll go live in Germany, but turns out there's not a huge need for private English teachers out there in the same way that there was in Spain. So that was serendipitous and linguistics kind of led into that very nicely because obviously when 
you spend all of that time really analyzing grammar and how language works, that translates quite well into explaining that to other people. Um, so it turned out to be very easy to get um, jobs as, as a linguist who became an ESL teacher. Yeah, that's a great point. All that stuff that's kind of intuitive to native speakers is, is hard to explain. And that if you're studying it, that, that comes up there. And that's a really good and important skill that we develop as linguists. Um, Anastasia. I was trying to think what was my first job, and it's had to pin down the exact first job because I had a lot of linguistics related jobs since undergrad. I worked as translator and interpreter for many years. And then I was teaching modern languages. I was teaching modern Greek for three or four years. I'm trying to remember for how many years. And I was also head of modern Greek library collection in Oxford for four or five years. So I've had all those jobs and each of them I found either through personal network or just seeing an application and applying. And definitely at the end, all those jobs helped me to get my current job because they all taught me different aspects. So I would genuinely encourage you to just be very open and to go for different types of jobs because when I'm now hiring people, I always like to see this diversity of, you know, you had a bit of language teaching experience, you have a bit of that experience, you had a bit of that experience. My real full-time job after graduation, after my PhD was the postdoc. And that was actually not particularly interesting pathway because that was postdoc in my own lab. <laughs> So I knew the person who was hiring and they needed somebody and they just asked, would you like to be on our grant? Mm -hmm. So that was a very easy transition, but the one that's easy, difficult to arrange. The next job was the same as everybody else. I was applying to many different positions. I got a number of interviews and the position at the TS was the one that I liked most that seemed to be most relevant to my skills. Interesting. So I, I, I think it's really interesting to see how for all three of you, there are lots of kind of different tactics that worked at, or, or different ways of getting jobs that worked over the course of your career. So in some cases, it's really about casting a broad net and and actually applying to these these jobs that you see online. And then other times there's a, a bit of networking happening. One um, area that I would I know is not very common in linguistics, but is very common in computer science is internships. Internships. An open eye for internships because often if they look for an LP person, they might actually hire a linguist. And we certainly always value people who did industry internships. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. Um, all right. So when you are creating updating your resume either for your job search or even now as you're keeping this updated or have you had interviews how do you talk about your skills as a linguist so the thing that i feel to be true regarding at least my particular role at duolingo and what we look for is that we understand that if you have a phd in linguistics that you can do linguistics <laughs> um that is not called into doubt. It is if you are going in the academic route and you're uh, worried about tenure and you're worried about standing in front of a room of people asking you hard questions about your paper. But when you're applying to a job, people will assume that you can do linguistic stuff. What they aren't sure of coming from academia is if you can manage a project, if you can interact with colleagues, if you can deliver something in one week that you would rather have one month to do. Those are the kinds of skills that I think you more have to prove out in industry than in academia. It's kind of switched. Um, so what I would recommend um, when putting together a resume or thinking about presenting yourself for those kinds of jobs is, you know, mention your, your, your research project, mention what you, you did as part of your particular work in linguistics, but um, make sure to highlight kind of what Anastasia was saying, the breadth of your experience. So if you did teaching, for instance, in my job, that was very important. Not that you did. I didn't just do research, that I was an active teacher in a classroom as well, and that I studied that, um, but that I also had that experience on the ground. So I made sure to mention that. I also mentioned you know, my prior job, how I had responsibilities for delivering things on time and managing projects, um, which by the way, if you've done a dissertation, you have done, managed a big project. Um, if you've done any research experience outside of uh, particulars of 
what you know what is just covered in your academic experience that's good to mention too but um yeah emphasizing that you have these these working abilities rather than just the language ones i think is pretty key yeah that's such a great point these are the, the these transferable skills uh, I, second that. I second that when we look for resumes coming from any field but also linguists we look for are you able to connect what you've done to what we might be doing so definitely you have to do your homework see what the company is working on and write the targeted cover letters saying you know this is how what i did is immediately related to what you are doing and we also look for soft skills like have you worked in a team are you able to work with other people are you able to resolve conflicts even if you work with somebody on a project where they told you to do something and you've done it well that's a useful piece of information This is a difficult question to answer for my job because my background as a linguist is sort of secondary to my background as an educator in the in the world that I'm in. Like I, I got this job mainly because I have a lot of teaching experience and it's it's a nice bonus that I'm a linguist because that comes with obviously a much greater amount of declarative knowledge than native speakers typically have about the English language, which is very useful when you're trying to explain it to students. Um, it also means that, you know, I, I think linguists have some advantages in things like copy editing and just like, you know, being able to articulate, this is why this isn't really working in, in a way that a lot, of, a lot of people aren't, even if they're fairly accomplished writers, like they, they might be like, that sounds weird, I don't know how to fix it. Um, so I think, I think we have an advantage in that sphere as well. I will second the thing about transferable skills. If any of you do have teaching experience, that is a big thing that you can parlay into explaining all of your work skills of managing people, managing conversations, um, project managing and teaching have a lot of skills in common. In terms of just having a million balls up in the air at once and trying to keep tabs on everything and who's doing what and um, as far as linguistics, I think the main thing that I bring to my job from my linguistics background is problem solving skills. Um, part of what appealed to me about EdTech is that it seemed to sit kind of at the intersection of having a lot of teaching experience and also having that kind of analytical linguistics background. It's a lot of problem solving and um, thinking through solutions. And I think I've probably adapted to the more technical aspects of my job which are not that many, but they are there a little bit more easily than I might have otherwise. Can you speak um, to those more technical aspects of your job? So, you know, at in in tech, what are some of the these more technical skills that you you think you do actually need to draw on? So, you know, do do any of you um, need to write code, or what other sorts of things come into these technical aspects? We, we we do our own HTML, um, which is actually a coding language I was lucky to learn at school. So that wasn't um, that wasn't too bad. The engineers do most of the technical lifting for us, but we're a startup and we have limited limited bandwidth. So everyone has to do a little bit. They, they really try to limit what we do because um, it's not it's not in our wheelhouse really. Um, a lot of what I do in code is actually um, plagiarizing other people's code and just changing the words. Um, but manipulating code in that way is a little bit, I think, more intuitive if you have come through that kind of understanding how language puts, to, like puts, puts together is helpful. More broadly, there's just a lot of understanding how to interface with machines that I didn't really have to do as a teacher at all. Like I, I was at a very low tech school. Um, so then understanding things like how how the back end works, like a working knowledge of like, what's going to break the site if I do this? Or just understanding how things work on the engineering end. There's a lot to, there's a lot to process. Um, so even though our actual coding is limited, we do have to understand a few things. I'm sure it might be similar to Duolingo, or I don't know how much coding you guys do. Yeah, so it's it's very similar in that I do, as part of my job requirements, I do absolutely zero coding. I don't need to know how to program. 
Um, I was, this was one of the biggest thing question I had in going into educational technology was, do I have to learn Python? Do I have to learn, um, you know, SQL or something like that, database language? Those things are not, not useful, but they were not at all part of my job description, job requirement. Um, and I don't, I, similar to what Sam said, I don't have to use those things. I, I could, if I wanted, I maybe could, you know, they could be useful, but I most have to know how they work at a, at a broad scale and how the people who use them all the time need me to know how them to work. <laughs> that made sense as the full sentence. Um, so I, these are things that I pick up on the job, you know, understanding the process, what is possible to do with code. Um, and so it, again, in terms of getting the job, I would not at all say you have to do a special program or le learn how to do this stuff. Um, unless it says specifically in the kinds of jobs you're looking at, some NLP jobs definitely you have to know Python, for instance. But if you're looking for a curriculum design job, it's I think probably pretty unlikely that you would have to have these skills. Again, just look at job descriptions, see what is listed there um, for the kinds of things you're interested. This is why informational interviews are also helpful. Um, but again, having that knowledge of how things generally work um, is probably far more useful in showing that you can adapt to that and learn to that um, to. To what you need to know rather than having to come in with those skills yourself because you're not going to be the programmer um, in these contexts again unless it's specifically said that in the job description um, i think the other thing i'll say just in terms of technical stuff is it actually helps to know how google sheets work i, I use google spreadsheets so much um, so that is something again that you'll pick up on the job you don't have to say i am a spreadsheet wizard but in terms of technical stuff knowing the basics of, of Excel is handy. Yeah, just to add on to Emily's point, yeah, definitely you need to know what would be considered the basics. Beyond that, I haven't, I don't think we require people to really know anything more than, you know, basic tech literacy. But if you do happen to know SQL, or if you have worked with data, that is definitely something that you should mention because there's a lot of data in ed tech and to the extent that we can do it ourselves, we'd like to. There's one person on my team who happens to be very good at SQL. She's a person who's code I plagiarize all the time to do my SQL. Um, so if that, if that has been a part of your client experience, definitely bring that up because they're going to want to know that you can do that. It's a, it's a big plus, if not a requirement. I, I definitely want to hear Anastasia's um, take on this, but I did want to kind of ask a, a follow-up question for... Um, Definitely Emily, maybe Sam as well. But I was wondering when you talk about needing to know how um, understand code and kind of how it works, can you maybe give an example of, of why you would need to know this? So something I was thinking about maybe is like writing requirements for, for a, how a curriculum might be implemented. Um, is that something that you, you would do? And, and yeah, speak to that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so as an example of what I need to understand, um, so like a Duolingo, when we're teaching stuff, right, when we're coming up with how to sequence things, we can't teach words that, we can't use a word in a sentence that you see on your device that you haven't seen before, right? Just from a pedagogical perspective, we don't want to show you something that you haven't been exposed to. But that might include, for instance, the exact spelling of the word, even though you've taught the concept, say third person, uh, singular s right maybe you um, have long since shown plays and um, walks and things like that but then you forget that you haven't added the exact word that has this s on it and you want to show um, uh, gives right and if you forgot to do that you there's you have to understand why that's impossible <laughs> and there's like a code reason which is that the code doesn't care about the word, that's a human concept. The code cares about G-I-V-E-S, right? Being coded into the system. So when you understand those aspects of what is possible or not possible, then you can communicate with the folks who are responsible for implementing it, which is definitely not me, and say, hey, could you write me something that would allow me to plop on an S to any uh, base form of a verb or something to that effect? Um, so that's the kind of way is that I need to understand what is or isn't possible with code or how code kind of generally works in our system and so I can communicate about it. Awesome, thank you. Um, and Anastasia, do you have any uh, 
So I was thinking that at ETS, we highly linguists in multiple divisions, and maybe I should give some background. ETS stands for Educational Testing Service. So we are the company behind TOEFL IBT and GRE and many other standardized tests. So we hire linguists in our test development department, where linguists maybe are writing questions, writing answers, questions and items for different tests. And there, there are no technical skills required. What they want is experience in language teaching, good copy editing skills, good understanding of what, how do you teach language. Then we also hire language uh, linguists into our research department, where we do research into second language learning. And linguists in that department might do a wide variety of studies. They might look where that TOEFL IBT test is really a good test in predicting your future success in academia. They might be looking into developing future tests. For example, how do you measure somebody's pragmatic competence? How do you measure whether somebody has cultural competence? And here, we are not necessarily looking for technical skills. We are looking for solid research base. We would be looking for PhD, preferably in that same area, second language acquisition, or if we are looking for cultural competence, maybe something that focuses in that area. And those linguists in those, that department do very much academic research similar to what you would do in the university. And so we are looking for skills that are same as you would be looking for in academic job, publication records, good knowledge of qualitative quantitative design, methodology, ability to present your work in the right way, ability to write, ask the right research questions. Now, my group is more engineering applied NLP group. We hire linguists too. So what we do, for example, we want to give feedback on your pronunciation. So we're building an app that gives you feedback on your pronunciation. And we have engineers who know a lot about signal processing, but we also need linguists who would be able to break the concept of pronunciation error into linguistically meaningful terms. Like, are we talking about abstract representation? Are we talking about specific contrast? Are we speaking about prosody? Are we speaking about connected speech processes? All those things that phoneticians know, but engineers don't know. Having said that, in our group, we are definitely looking for very strong technical skills. So we usually look for knowledge of Python, we look for experience with machine learning models. And usually people who are behind NLP would be the ones who have done either postdoc or PhD with some machine learning component to it. And there are phoneticians and linguists who come with that background, but for this job, I would definitely recommend learning Python, learning shell scripting definitely learning something about uh, machine learning. Uh, does the CS research team hire primary linguists doing research and language testing specifically or SLA in general? SLA in general. It depends a lot. We have a lot of careers posted on our website. You could see the description. They usually say what the background is expected to, do, to be. Would you say, is, is it both? So you have some uh, so we hire people with the background in educational measurement. We also hire people with the background in second language acquisition. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, what about, so we talked about some of kind of the skills that you've brought with you to your jobs. Uh, what about some of the skills that you've learned on the job that you think are, are useful to what you've done? or what you're doing now like i've certainly become much more of an engineer <laughs> having learned i've learned a lot about engineering and programming just from working with colleagues and being very hands-on i also learned a lot about test development and assessment i did not i was not an assessment person before i came in and it was fascinating to learn about how those tests are designed how do people ensure their fairness their validity even the terms themselves what do they mean all the things that i learned after i came to uts and of course, you learn a lot about how to work with people, how to manage people, how to work in the industry. Mm -hmm. I've definitely learned, like Anastasia was just saying, those soft skills, which is a term I hate. I need to find a better one for it because they're they're essential, as, as essential as you know your technical knowledge. I think in your field um, about working with others and and what it means to actually make something exist in the world. Um, that isn't just a, a paper or a, a PhD, that a dissertation that takes a very long time to make and is, you know, maybe read by 10 people max, um, but to actually make something that's out there that is used by lots of people and kind of what goes into that and the intense amount of collaboration and um, 
giving up of a sense of self in order to benefit the, the greater good for making something exist in the world. Um, so that sort of very active collaboration and that process has been a big learning for me. In terms of like more technical skills, I have learned a lot about the specifics of um, I, my experience in sort of my theoretical teaching was more about the basic principles of, of thinking about how language learning happens or literacy through oracy. And in my job, I had to be extremely specific with thinking about the actual grammar structures, the phrases, the collocations, the words that go into the cipher levels of English and other languages. And so now I have a very good intuition for what like an A2 sentence is um, or A2.2 sentences versus A2.1. And so those are definitely skills I didn't have before starting at Duolingo that I think have made me a stronger person who knows about curricula, language curricula in general. Um, so I think both kinds of soft and hard skills can come through a job. I have become a better writer since starting to work at a writing and grammar company. I feel like I've had a lot, now that I'm making this curriculum, it's like, I wish I'd had this in school because we've been really not explicitly taught how to write very well. So I've, I've actually learned a lot just from doing the job, but it's also a very different way of presenting information from being in the classroom where you're live and you're talking and you see the kids and you're like, hey, you look confused. I'm going to try to say that another way. With what I do now, it has to be totally clear on the screen. There isn't any space to add that clarification. So it's really finding very specific and concise language. Um, I would second what Emily said about collaboration. That was a big shift for me coming out of the classroom where really it was all on me, and like just me and the students now working with other adults and having to be in a, in a team and working together also over long-term projects like some of our projects take weeks months to complete it's not okay got to plan today's lesson okay did today's lesson that's done next thing maybe it went well or maybe it didn't um there's a lot more back and forth and like revising things and yeah that, that's been an interesting shift as well i would say mm -hmm. you probably have the the opposite too if you're coming from academia and a phd where things happen very fast in industry, I think at a much faster pace than they do in academia sometimes as well. So it kind of depends on, on the project maybe. This and I was gonna ask if any of your learned on the job skills have kind of contributed to your current responsibilities and, and your current roles, like basically what you've, if you've been able to find some expertise in what you're learning on, on the job and distinguish yourself that way. Um, I have an example that that I can share um, for context. So I have a, a colleague who has a, a bachelor's in Mandarin and linguistics. She's a very talented linguist um, and she came on to work with us at Mango and she just really honed in on our, our authoring tool. So basically the, the tool that we use to, to enter and create content. And she now knows that system probably better than anyone in the company aside from the person who created it. Um, and she's always looking for ways to improve it for the teachers and stuff. And she's become essentially like our, our expert on that, which is very different from what she, she learned, um, you know, in her linguistics degree. Uh, and I see, I see that a lot uh, at Mango where people kind of find ways, find, find niches for themselves. And I was wondering if you guys had any experience with that or, or examples of where you learn things on the job that have really contributed to what you're now able to do. I would say most things I'm now doing, I learned on the job. Yeah. Because really also the field is changing so fast that also thinking about most of my colleagues, those who graduated more than 10 years ago, everything we learned in university, well, the theory is there, but the technology has moved on so fast, the methodology has moved on so fast that we just all continuously learning on the jobs. In fact, everybody I know is constantly taking Coursera courses or Udacity courses to learn new methods, to learn about new models, to learn about new approaches. Yeah. Because really, I can think nothing that I used in my PhD is still current. <laughs> Some of the models may be. Linear regression, of course, is still there. Mm -hmm. But beyond that. And certainly we see a lot of people moving. They come as a linguist and some people become 
chief VP of technology, or maybe they become business CEOs. There are lots and lots of possible career paths. Yeah, so uh, it's the same at Duolingo where we really emphasize like continued learning within our field, not uh, not just uh, things that within the job, but yeah, we all are encouraged to attend conferences like LSA or others that are relevant to our subfields um, and, you know, are, are uh, paid to, to go to them, to attend them. Um, in terms of stuff that's unique to learning on the job, in, in my case, um, yeah, I had the opportunity, I've always been interested in pronunciation teaching and just oral language proficiency in general. And so at Duolingo, I was, there was a project floating around that people were sort of like, oh, I don't know if I really want to do this. Someone else was like excited, but I was like, oh, I really want to come up with all the different sound teaching um, for English. And I want to come up with all the different sound letter mappings and all the different phonological contrasts. Um, so maybe Anastasia and I are similarly nerds about that. Um, even though it's not like, you know, my, my, my sole role not to be the sound teaching person, but it was something I gladly signed up for. And as a result, you know, have this knowledge of our English teaching courses um, uh, as they relate to the sound aspects. Um, so that's an example of something that was sort of available that was um, I could express my personal interest in and, and kind of own uh, as an opportunity as sort of a, a niche thing as, as a um, linguist or, or curriculum designer person at the company. That's really cool. Yeah, for me, my trajectory over the last three and a half years that I've been at Noah Dink has been one of starting out basically writing content to spec. So, you know, here, here's what we do, do the thing. And then that turned into, okay, now you help the team do that thing. You're in charge of making that one thing that we've already figured out. And since then, having learned more about the ed tech and having completed more of that work, that has turned into managing bigger and much more ambiguous projects and really solving design issues and thinking about user needs, what do, what do teachers need, what do students need, especially this past year, um, working for K-12 content when everyone's been remote learning. It's been a lot of thinking about, okay, what, what can we do that's gonna be helpful and really taking on more of that design work and figuring out myself, okay, what, what are we going to make here? Which is big and sometimes a little bit overwhelming because it's like blank canvas almost. Um, but yeah, kind of increasing amounts of ambiguity and autonomy, but probably fair to say they've never given me anything that was outside of my zone of proximal development to borrow a term from <laughs> teaching. Um, but yeah, we, we, we also emphasize, you know, continued growth. We have levels within each role. I think even sub levels within each level, but we're expected to just move. We were like increasingly take on more and more things, but we're continually growing in, in the role. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think sometimes in the job process, we're, you know, we're looking for a role that we want to fill. And it's really important to keep in mind that we can like grow and change in that role and, and within that company as well. Um, you know, and possibly onto onto other other career moves. So it's good to see examples of, of how that can happen. Uh, okay, so moving on, I have a lot of skills questions. Um, so I I think we have a, a a range of people with different different backgrounds in linguistics here, and so I wanted to ask a bit about your the degree requirements for your job. So does your position uh, require a PhD or a master's um, or a, a bachelor's to either to get hired or um, to actually do the job. So could you have gotten the job without a, one of these more advanced degrees? Um, and are you able to perform it or are people at a similar level able to perform it without that training? I'll go first. I don't have a PhD. Um, I don't even have a master's. I have a BA in German of linguistics and a postgraduate diploma in TESOL, which is um, a useful diploma to have when you work in TESOL, but not really one that people in the US have even heard of. So that's you know nice, but definitely not helpful. On my team, we have a couple of people who don't have master's degrees. Most of the people have masters. We have in the past had people who had PhDs. It certainly doesn't hurt, but it's not a requirement. I don't think my team would hire someone 
it doesn't have a bachelor's just because they don't hire people who haven't had teaching experience and I think one is a prerequisite to the other but yes yeah, certainly in my company PhD not required not required yeah it's yeah, yeah. Some companies will have like internships maybe for the the pre-bachelors level ETS is very formal in this respect. We have all the specific roles. The research scientist must have a PhD, even though they would often be open-minded to what area PhD is in, but PhD must be there. But we have positions for research engineers and research associates, and those two require masters. And then I believe positions in test development might only require bachelor. I do not think we can't, we don't hire without bachelor, but we have a number of internships. I posted some links into the chat. Thank you. Yeah, similarly, Duolingo will specify if a master's is required or if a PhD is required. But something that I think surprised me about coming to the company was that within sometimes for certain roles, it's not so much about that you need the PhD to do the certain thing, like being a curriculum designer is a good example. I have colleagues who are at different points of the career ladder based on their educational background. So I'm a curriculum designer too. Um, I have a colleague who has a master's degree who does extremely similar work to me, just with slightly fewer responsibilities, who's a curriculum designer one. And then I have colleagues who are senior curriculum designers who, again, we do really similar work just with, they have slightly more responsibilities than I do. Um, so in that sense, although we might try to hire for a band within those, a job announcement might say master's is the minimum. And then if you have a PhD, or PhD plus five years of experience, you might just get hired at one of those different points in the career ladder, but do similar things, uh, essentially. Um, so that that's another thing to keep in mind is that there might be jobs similar to what Anastasia mentioned, where you know there is a certain degree minimum, and we do have jobs that are like a PhD minimum, but we also have jobs where you might fall just on a certain range um, in that ladder and still be. Uh, encouraged to apply. So that's what, one of the reasons why if you see like bachelor's is minimum, PhD, you know, uh, desired or something, you should still apply because they might just be looking for someone who could be in that first role of, or first tier of the career ladder, but still do similar kinds of work. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, okay. What, uh, so my next question is, what do you wish you had known about your industry before you graduated? So maybe like what skills would you have acquired? What classes would you have taken? Would you have started networking earlier? Any, any other hindsight uh, insights? I think for, for me, so I only started thinking about ed tech my fifth year, my final year of grad school when I, uh, I guess that was technically my first job in ed tech was freelancing for i think it was amazon doing like a freelancer thing a gig um on kind of like a natural language recognition uh checking uh so they needed to hire like a chief grad student to do um and it was the first time i realized that i had any skills that were transferable whatsoever to anything related to tech i thought i just at a baseline had to know how to code um, and i just didn't for this, they just needed someone who knew linguistics and could compare their human linguistic knowledge to a machine's. Um, and I immediately tried taking, like, signed up for uh, the class in my department in um, in NLP that we just hired someone. And previously, again, I just thought, oh, that's going to be way outside of my wheelhouse. And I really enjoyed it. I was finding it like super interesting and, and very transferable. And then I just had to drop it because I had to write my dissertation and <laughs> that was more important at the time uh and so I had just I wish that I had started earlier but at the same time I have been able to um you know find this career in ed tech that you know didn't require me getting in earlier I think if I could go back in time I would just say don't be afraid to don't feel like I'm pigeonholed I wish I could have said don't feel like I have to do the certain thing in a certain way because I always have but to say to be more open to a breadth of things um to trust myself more that like ed tech is a possibility for myself that just because i don't have this background in coding or technical stuff doesn't mean i can't um be interested or explore these things and kind of as has been mentioned like casting this wider net for yourself um is is i think something to 
to and being creative um something that i personally encourage i wish i had had done a little earlier on but it, it still worked out i think i would have been more proactive about looking for internships i had various jobs but i actually never had an internship while i was in grad school and i wish i was more proactive looking for opportunities and doing them more because that's a very good experience and another thing i wish i would have done is look for it's different in the uk where i did my phd and in the us but i would look for more opportunities to work on various projects not just on my phd project but you know if somebody needs a research assistant i would try to embed myself into that to learn because this gives you a wider network that gives you new skills and it gives you much more to speak about when you apply for job because i know when i interview i like hearing and i worked on that and i also did a bit of this and i also did a bit of this yeah, you've, you guys have mentioned this breadth of skills and experience a, a couple of times, and it's a, a really good point. Sam? I don't think there's anything I would have done differently about my university experience or my years spent teaching. I really loved teaching, and there was no doubt that I was going to be doing that. But moving to the States, um, you know, I, I'm not certified to teach in this country and there was a lot of uncertainty about okay what do I even do now do I want to throw myself back into teaching and I think just taking the time to figure out what I wanted to do and like for the first time since starting my like professional life just taking a break and like sitting with you know like, oh, I have to find something right now like trying to figure it out um shout out to Anna Marie Trester and her career camp which I did shortly after I moved to the States just to um, connect with other linguists who were trying to figure out their next steps and also just get some clarity around job searching and what even are my options? Like, what can I do with this linguistics degree that I have in my back pocket? And doing a lot of informational interviews then and talking to people was very helpful in figuring out next steps. So perhaps one thing I should have done more of was networking earlier in my career it's just it's not really a thing you do when you're a teacher you don't really need to that much but it's actually been very useful in getting this job and then afterwards just connecting with other people and hearing hey what do you do do you do a cool thing tell me about what you do just like you know approach of curiosity and be open-minded another thing i would say is that tech job descriptions are very intimidating it is not always clear what is a must have and what is a nice to have. And my company might be a little bit more flexible than some. You know, as I said, we don't require advanced degrees. We don't require a ton of technical experience. My experience is that tech companies care about whether you can do the job. So if you think you have the competencies that they are looking for, don't, don't be put off applying. But there are definitely some jobs that I looked at and I was like, oh, I definitely can't do that. And in retrospect, yeah, I, I probably could have done that. Um, so yeah, it's, it, and there's a lot of big words and jargony things. You will totally murder them on the job if you if you go into this field. Um, I would just say, you know, if it looks good to you, go for it. Um, and just yeah, don't, don't don't be put off by by the technical stuff. Yeah, there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff happening with with job applications and you never know what's going to be prioritized for a given team at any given moment. For sure. Um, I know we definitely have situations when this is probably similar to what Emily is saying, where we end up hiring someone with a master's, even though we have a lot had a lot of PhD applicants because that person fit better with what we were doing at the time. What's an interesting project that you're working on right now? I can't tell you about the current project, <laughs> but I can tell you about my favorite project I've worked for the last several years. They've been prototyping an application to encourage children to read. And the concept that we came up with was a child listens to a page of audiobook and then reads aloud. And then they listen to a page of audiobook and then they read aloud. And when they read the audio of their reading is recorded and is being sent to our service where we do we evaluate their accuracy, their words correct per minute, their reading fluency, and then we give teachers the reports about how they're doing. And the whole concept relied on the fact that it's not an assessment, it's not a test, we are giving you a fun book to read. 
Initially, for the first experiments, we had permission to use Harry Potter, but this was for first experiments. Later on, we used a variety of books like Wizard of Oz, Pinocchio, some more Henry stories, some Sherlock Holmes stories. And the, we have the actually up, I can post the link later in the chat. But the most fulfilling part of it was going to schools, going to summer camps and observing kids interacting with our app. And then seeing how they were getting into reading, how they were loving reading, and then going back and listening to their reading and thinking, what can I do to help this child read better? And as a phonetician, I would think of things like, you know, can I help them with intonation? How can I work on intonation? What can I do with pausing? And then I would talk to reading scientists about their point of view of what helps people improve their reading. And that was really lots of fun to do. That sounds fantastic, yeah. My current project is expanding Meredith's library of texts. Over the time I've been with the company, we've kind of moved from, when I started, we were really building out a guided writing curriculum. Like this is basically a guided interface to help students write essays and you know, tips and tricks along the way. And we finished building out all of the different types we wanted to do for that um, a couple of years into my time here. And since then we've been trying to move more into literacy more broadly and you know getting text on the site that kids can read and analyze and engage with so a lot of what i've been doing this past year has been sourcing texts and creating text analysis content to go about which is super fun um, for anybody who has any kind of literature background to be doing and the other fun thing about that is that we're always trying to one up the, the big curricular textbooks in terms of what can we do that's a little bit more engaging, a little bit more unexpected, not always necessarily the safest options, um, or just for one for literally every English language arts textbook since the dawn of time. Um, so that, that has been a lot of fun to work on. Great, awesome. Um, for me, I would say that I, uh, I'm basically in a position where I'm finally able to help improve Duolingo's teaching of indigenous and um, threatened languages, which is something I had somehow forgot to mention in my background that my undergrad and master's degree were in indigenous language documentation and revitalization, a big focus of that um, and the social aspects of those things. So it's something I'm just passionate about and um, Duolingo teaches maybe around 10 or so languages you could say fit under that broad umbrella and um they've traditionally kind of received the fewest resources because you know there's more folks who are interested in learning french and spanish but i feel really strongly about their importance um both for the speakers as well as for the, the world and the ecological potential that the languages have so i'm really happy that i get to work more closely on those courses um and recently, we just launched the, our Yiddish course for speakers of English, and that's um, one of my heritage languages. So it was really fulfilling to be able to put this language that many people think of as being kind of antiquated into the hands of, of people, many of whom are uh, much younger than the, my family, who's currently speaks it to our grandparents, um, and uh, getting people using this, this app um, and to re-engage with this language uh, was really deeply satisfying and uh, wonderful. That's amazing. Yeah, and there's such a big role for these, um, for tech in the preservation of indigenous languages right now and, and getting it to speakers. Um, awesome. Well, I want to make sure that we have time for the attendees to ask questions. So I'd like to now turn turn it over to the rest of you who are participating so feel free to uh, turn your cameras on and ask questions i'll also in the meantime i'll try to scroll through the chat and see if there are any questions that we missed but you can go ahead and ask questions if you like um hi everyone thank you for um coming and talking to us it was really informative um Recently, I've been like looking at different ways that I can like learn different skills. And one of the things I've noticed is there's a lot of um, certificates offered now for like um, industrial design, um, ed tech and like curriculum design, those kinds of things. So I was just wondering if it's a good idea to kind of sign up for those courses, whether they're like the online, the free versions or 
with a local like college or something to kind of like, I guess, beef up our resume. Um, Cause a lot of the job descriptions kind of ask for that or if it's okay to just go in with like a linguistics degree. So I'm not a hiring manager, um, meaning I don't regularly screen resumes to like approve or deny them. Um, my feeling is that that is sort of not bad. It's, it's nice to have it, but not a really a make or break um, for, for you and, or for the role. I would sort of be inclined kind of, I already said this to look for what kind of the job description is. And if for, for instance says it needs, you know, a certain amount of experience doing a certain thing that the certificate won't replace that, you know, when, um, but that it could maybe potentially help you to get experience in that field. I, I would think of it as like a bonus or a nice to have, but not necessarily something that would probably replace that requirement if it's a hard one. Um, that being said, I don't think it can hurt. And it could also give you some exposure to whether or not you like that thing with the caveat that the experience of taking an online course could be very different from actually doing the thing for better and for worse. Um, so that's all to say maybe, <laughs> and probably you'll get more a richer experience than like talking to someone or reaching out to someone from that company and getting a sense of if that course is or companies are interested in and seeing if that's the kind of thing that would be beneficial or not. That was a great question. Thank you, Janice. I don't know if, if Sam or Anastasia, if you had any anything to add to that. Mm, we don't we don't pay attention to just certificates if they are not supported by something you've done. So if in the highly unlikely situation when you are really same with another candidate, we might look at it. We might appreciate certificate as an evidence that what we are looking for is an evidence that you are not just doing what your supervisor or what your advisor tells you, but you are willing to go and explore things yourself. So going and doing other courses could be evidence of this sort of being proactive and curious and exploring other areas, but I wouldn't focus on just getting credentials if they don't lead to some sort of output on top of that. Unless you just yourself want to do it. If you just want to do it for yourself, by all means go into it, of course. Yeah, we haven't hired in a while. We're gonna be hiring soon. I, I haven't seen the job post for us that's gonna be going out. I don't think we're gonna be asking for any credentials at all. We're, we're pretty non-specific about um, what actual qualifications people need to have. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I would agree with what Emily said. It might, it might be a plus, but it's certainly not. I, I don't know how much stock our hiring managers are going to put in online courses versus um, experience or demonstrably having the, the skills of the job. We also tend to like not hire people who have ed tech experience. Um, I think only one person on my team has previously worked in ed tech and the rest of us came more or less out of the classroom and kind of learned on the job. Thank you. There was oh. a question just recently in the chat about the length of the hiring. We have very lengthy hiring process in general because it's usually open position and then there is the phone screen and after phone screen they have the what we used to call on campus visit now it's virtual and after that we would usually wait until they have a couple candidates so the whole hiring process can easily take a month or two. Although it depends, if somebody is really strong and we feel like we must have them, we might move a bit faster. But I would say in general, with companies like ETS, if you submitted your CV and you haven't heard for a week, it's not a reason to despair. Yeah, it's the same. It's exact same as Anastasia. It can vary, but oh, a month or two is pretty normal. And you, you probably wouldn't go longer than a month without hearing from someone. Um, although things can also change, and I think someone mentioned this, but it is really, you have to keep in mind that there's so much you just can't see about the hiring process. Like maybe you applied this perfect job, you're an amazing fit, but you're the hundredth applicant. Um, and they already have three people in interviews. Like you're probably not going to get it, even if you're amazing. And you also, you know, someone might say, encourage you to reapply. You really liked your profile. The, the, we're so busy we get so many applications we we're not going to keep it on file and reach out like that's just really unusual um because there's just so many really qualified folks so you have to resubmit your application even if you're outstanding and amazing it's not a reflection of your quality you just have to 
keep resending your application that happened to me at Duolingo. I submitted like at the tail end of one hiring process and got a nice email that said, look out for the next one. And I did. So yeah, you have to have some vigilance about those things. I'm just going to similar, just... similar in terms of time, but we hire on a voting basis. Um, so I think for me, it was a month from start to finish, but that was all actively in, in the process. Um, so I applied and then had to go through screens and then and on site, which I, I guess is virtual now. Um, and on the technical interviews, um, kind of job tests, like I think I had to um, break down how I would teach a concept on a whiteboard at one point, um, which was not a part of any of my previous hiring experiences for teaching jobs. So that was that was new. But yeah, I say be, be prepared for there to be a lot of stages. And yeah, similarly, volume of applications is very high. So just just be prepared not to hear back. I guess there are definitely some jobs I apply to in EdTech and I just, I still haven't heard back. I guess they're not interested because it was three years ago. Um, we can just be prepared for that too. I, I know like at Mango, we have a, a certain window where we have to at least respond to people and, and then kind of, but how long it actually takes in the process could be a month, could be a few months, it depends. Um, I see Wei, I see your hand up. Do you have a question? Yeah, um, thank you for the wonderful panel. I'm wondering how this kind of job opportunities apply work with international applicants because, you know, this is a training and education position. And I am a phonetician. I think I know a lot about pronunciation and um, contrast, but I am not a native speaker and I might make errors um, in my grammar. So um, in that situations, how are we supposed to contribute if we are interested in this kind of opportunity? That's my question. I'm not a native speaker. <laughs> yeah, I know that is. <laughs> not bad. We usually, we don't look at for positions unless it's a position which specifically says native level of English. We don't, most of our hires actually are not native speakers thinking through my group. We have about 60% of non-native speakers. We look clearly for ability to communicate in English, for ability to communicate research ideas, but beyond that, you don't have to be native speaker to be a good linguist. I think being a non-native speaker is probably a great thing, <laughs> working at a, many ed tech companies too. I, 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 for a fact, you know, our, the head of our, 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 our function is a non-native speaker of English and it's a pro to speak more than one language and what I do for sure. Uh, and any small errors you make, I don't think, you know, that's as long as they don't impact your ability to communicate, as I just said. The thing to really be more concerned about, I think, is if you have work uh, visa um, requirements, if you're truly international and you don't have a green card, that's something you don't want to go through the whole process of writing a beautiful cover letter and everything if you can't get permission to do the job. So if you are international, just just encourage you to make reach out to the to the to the company and see what are the actual requirements because that's something people, they're very inflexible on. Um, so you want to make sure that that's squared away first, unfortunately. Well, I, I would add to that that some companies will hire international people remotely. Um, my my team ha my curriculum team happens to be all based in the U.S. and kind of they, they do prefer people who have experience of the US context of that particular job but we have people in other roles in Europe and in South America so you never know. I had experience interviewing for a company for a position I didn't take where they had an arrangement with the university for really strong candidates so if the position is really something you want I would try to apply for that recruiters would usually ask you anyway where you stand on the visa situation. Yeah, that's true. Those are good points. Duolingo does, for instance, have an office in Beijing and an office in Berlin that we're just opening up now. So um, we have other positions, but they'll generally be listed in the job title that they are, you know, the, the position has to be based there. Yeah. I'll just add that Mango also has some flexibility there. Um, so 
some jobs are preferred in the US or it can only happen in the US, but sometimes they will make an exception and you know they're able to do that. Um, but definitely agree on the being a non-native speaker is not an issue. It's a probably an asset. Um, let's see. I, there's another question here from Paulina. Do you want to ask your question? Okay. Um, sorry, I, I get online kind of late, so I don't know if you really mentioned this at the beginning. So if you did it, I'm really sorry. But I would like to know. I have seen sometimes some positions uh, related to tech that you don't really have options to make a career. It's like you get into, you have your position. If you want to move forward, you need to kind of try to get a new position, find a new, like trying to apply for a new job in somewhere else. So what about your companies? Is it something that you can get uh, promotions? Uh, how farther you can go in your career in this sense, if, if, it's, if it's an option? At the TS, for each of the functions, we have um, career levels. So, for example, as a research scientist, you are usually hired as associate research scientist. And then, depending on your performance, you are promoted to research scientist, then you are promoted to senior research scientist, and then you might be the research director or principal research scientist. And I think after that, you probably have to go into exec level if that's your thing. <laughs> and the same as for engineers, there's also assistant associates just engineer, senior, principal, and for other positions too, there's a natural career ladder. But at least in ATS, it's also the case that, yes, you can move along your function, but you can also be proactive and move into a different function or move into a different job role. This is always an option, but it's up to you to show that initiative and to show that you can be in a different role. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, Duolingo is also very invested in like keeping people at, at the company and, and giving them opportunities to um, progress and get promotions if you're interested in that. Um, so there are, you know, we have conversations very regularly and I talk with my manager a lot about what it looks like to be at the next level and how to get there and what the kinds of responsibilities are. Um, and we have a very clearly defined like it's called a career ladder of what the sort of next steps are, kind of like when Anastasia was listing that are very clear. And um, yes, the idea of, of having a career at this, at this one company is definitely something that's talked about and um, promoted a lot. Yeah, similar at my company. Um, we have, I think, levels one to five for individual contributors like me. The expectation is that you're just gonna keep leveling up over time. I've leveled up twice in my time at the company. Um, we have goal setting conversations with managers a couple of times a year, and, you know, looking at, okay, what's in the next level? What are you doing now? How are you going to level up eventually? At a certain level, you become eligible for um, people management roles or team lead roles, if that is an area of interest for you. And yeah, I, I think, I think that invested in having us, you know, continually grow and not his interest and get to do new things. So, yeah, I think I think I would be able to stay at the company for a long time and not not feel like I had got everything out of the bill, but I'm never going to get out of it. It's a good question to ask during an interview. What are the next steps? And I know that for us, there are multiple ways that you can build your career. You can go into more managing positions where you really don't do as much research, but you manage people, or you could go more into principal research scientist where you more or less like an academic researcher who has their own research group so you might not be managing people but you are managing the research or you could decide to go more into business where you really work with business people and do more of the product management alex asked if if you would be able to if any of you, you would be able to give an example of a salary range for some of these different levels so like entry level next level etc I'm afraid I can't. <laughs> I, I can't give certain really good numbers because it's not something I have insight into as a manager, but way higher than anything you could expect to get in academia is what I'll just say at the outset. Um, 
yeah, it, it's at the level that I'm at, it would be normal to be hired the upper five figures, lower six figures um, at, if you have a PhD. Um, and then if you have experience plus PhD, more, if you have a master's degree, I would say probably around the level of an entry level professor. <laughs> it seems crazy, but yeah, that's about what you can expect relative to academia. And I would say always negotiate your salary. If you can, my company doesn't negotiate salaries. They have a very specific um, thing that they use. Um, I'm not going to do numbers just because my company also ties your salary to your geographic location. Yeah, um, but because you, can we are, try. Yes. you can always try at least. Yeah. So my company, San Francisco, is in line with San Francisco cost of living. And depending on where else you are in the, in the country, like that's calculated as a percentage of the San Francisco salary, depending on if, if you live in Austin or if you live somewhere where the cost of living is a lot lower, it's going to be a different salary as well. So I, I won't do numbers. What I will say is that the, <clears throat> the raises at different levels have felt pretty substantial um, coming out of teaching. So. Uh, there's another question um, from Samantha, which is kind of related. We're already talking about this a little bit, and I'm, I'm going to add to it as well. So uh, her question, so Samantha, I hope you don't mind if I read this. Um, her question is, is it the norm to negotiate salary and benefits at your company? And I think another related question is whether, if you can speak to asking for raises as well and promotions. So like Anastasia said, you should always negotiate at the outset. That's normal and expected um, once you get the offer, right? <laughs> Not before that. Um, so once you have the offer, there's kind of, you do want to ask around other folks that you might know to get a sense of the range, but it's good to aim high. The You're not going to get your offer retracted. The worst that'll happen is they'll laugh at you and be like, no, sorry, like that's way too much, but we can do this. Right. They're not going to just make the offer or anything like that. Um, the you can also something some really great advice I was given when negotiating was that you should always negotiate for things that aren't just salary, because there's also other things they might be more flexible on that could be relevant to your life, um, like commuting benefits or um, stock options. If it's a startup, um, those things as I asked about. Um, some of those things do lingo, like for instance, um, PTO and stock options were actually not flexible, um, but some other companies they are. Um, so it's worth to ask about all the range of benefits, not just the base salary. In terms of asking about more, I think was that part of your question, like more asking about salary after the fact, it's pretty clearly laid out how your bonuses and raises and things work once you're at the company. Um, and they're also, the company's pretty transparent about why people get the money they do and how they work to be equitable across gender and salary and range and things like that. So there are routes to talk about it if you have questions, but it would probably be something you would just like say out of the blue. Um, that could be seen as kind of gauche or not, not appropriate. Uh, <laughs> but there are definitely ways to talk about it, like with your manager, for instance, if you had questions. Yeah, and I don't think that's always the case that that's transparently laid out. So that's that in and of itself is really helpful to know that there's a, a, a system there that's clear. Usually your first conversation with the company, based on my experience, would be with an HR person. And they are more than willing to answer this sort of questions, how promotion works, how raises work. These are often very company specific and very role specific. Sam, I think you spoke to this a little bit already. I don't know if you had anything else to add. Yeah, my company won't negotiate. Um, so, and that's, and that's for equity reasons, um, because as we know, some people tend to get a lot better in negotiation than others do. Um, so there's very specific guidelines around who is paid what at what level, in what geographic location. Um, 
um, promotions and raises go go hand in hand. If you, if you level up, you're going to be getting the raise accordingly. Um, similarly, benefits are they are what you get. Um, they're, they're pretty good benefits. I don't know if there's a ton of room to negotiate on those. Um, I will say that my company is pretty good at working with people when they ask for what they need. So you should ask things like, you know, how, I mean, we, we have a flexible slash unlimited PTO policy, question mark. Um, it's, it's a lot more flexible than anything I've ever had as a teacher. So don't, don't be afraid to ask questions about like, hey, how, how does this work? Like one of my options, I think coming out of a very rigid um, structure like working in schools I didn't even really know like what was available to me as a as a professional in the industry so ask ask a lot of questions I would say about what what the rules and I, I'm a former teacher like everything is rules in my head but like policies are because yep. you might be surprised basically by what's available to you that's why it also helps to maintain your network and to grow it because this is where the best solution would be to reach out to somebody else who works there and ask them to tell you how it is to work in that company and ask all those questions. Mm -hmm. Well, we only have a few more minutes. Uh, I just wanted to ask you if any of you, if there's anything that we haven't talked about that you haven't been asked that you'd like to share or mention before we go. I'm thinking... One of the mistakes I commonly see people commit when we interview is that instead of being curious and learning about the company, people come focused on their PhD. And the person just talks and talks and talks about what they've done for their PhD without looking at our company website and seeing what we do. And another major thing that happens every now and then is we always ask, do you have any questions for us? And people would say, have you done X? I have this great idea you haven't done, but of course it's right on our website first thing. And this is not a good impression to give. So do your homework. Don't try to come across as smart, no all, but rather try to learn as much as you can about the company before coming to the interview. That's something that trips up people surprisingly off. Um, well, definitely agree with what Anastasia just said. Uh, do, do your homework, especially if you get the in-person interview, you definitely want to come prepared and knowledgeable. Um, but also for writing that cover letter too, that's a, that's a big yes or no, that would kind of make or break you. Um, and I would say that just, yeah, I would reiterate the value of collecting a lot of experience. That was something I did. Um, I did a professional development program for Alt-AC in my last year of grad school. So check on your campuses and see if there are things of that nature that really prepared me to feel confident to even think about myself as um, a non-academic linguist. Um, and I do still think of myself as a linguist, just not one in academia. Um, so, and then, yeah, those informational interviews I did, collecting that network, like um, other panelists have mentioned, um, really, kind of collecting experience and not being afraid to reach out and ask questions. Um, something I really try to do is <laughs> do these kinds of outreach panels and respond to people who ask me questions on LinkedIn because I did so much of that when I was a grad student. Um, and I was so confused about how all this stuff worked. So I think many people you'll find are very receptive and very kind and want to help you out too. Um, so yeah, just cast that wide net and um, stay curious. Yeah, I'll second what Emily just said, because I was going to say the same thing. Um, transitioning into industry, one of the things I had to get over was like re reaching out to people I don't know to ask questions. Because between being an introvert and being from a culture where, oh gosh, I couldn't possibly impose. Um, you know, actually, I, I was surprised by um, people being receptive just to talking to me about their jobs. So if you see someone who has a job that you like the look of, you know, just and they reach out. Worst, worst case scenario is like they're like, uh, no, um, but you know, you're, you're not going to burst into flames if you reach out to someone um, on LinkedIn. Like Emily, I found that I had a lot of help from connections I made early on in living in the States, and I'm happy to pay that forward. One thing I would say is that it's worth reaching out for information interviews before you apply. Once you're in the pipeline, it gets a little bit more complicated for people who are already at the company to talk to you 
um, because I don't feel somehow a bit unfair if you're already in the process. Um, so I would just say maybe if you if you do want to learn more before you apply, do it do it earlier rather than later, just so that it doesn't create a weird conflict. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah. You know, don't, don't don't be afraid to connect with people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great advice. Well, thank you all so much for uh, for your your answers in this discussion today. I, I think this was really interesting. I hope this was helpful for everyone. Mm -hmm.